So good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to this Wednesday evening program. Those of you here in 43 Lancaster Gate, and those of you in cyberspace, nice to have you on board. Last week, I think, those of you who are here, you heard an explanation about the principle of creation, right? And in that explanation, you heard about a very beautiful idea to create a world of uh, happiness, fulfillment, peace, prosperity, joy, all the most wonderful things that you can imagine uh, this world can and should be. And maybe you got very inspired. How many of you here last week, by the way? You, okay. So, sometimes when you listen to that presentation, uh, it, you can really, in a way, go off into sort of a dream world, imagining what the world could have been like. But then, of course, as soon as you walk out the door here, you suddenly understand uh, this is not the reality we're living in. And uh, just switch on the TV, go on the internet, read a newspaper, you see so much news about suffering and happiness, misery, sadness, and so on. And uh, you might wonder, well, why is the world like this? And I know that this evening we have with us somebody who's here for the first time to hear. So I'm starting a little bit further along the line than we normally would start uh, with this presentation. Because usually in our first presentation we actually explain what the world should have been like. This one, this evening, it begins to look at the issue of what the world is like and why it is like it is right now. And uh, there are actually three main parts to our teaching. The first is what we call the principle of creation, which discusses the issue of the very question of God's existence. How can we come to understand that there is a God? Can we understand also the reason for God's creating? Because a lot of people might think, well, does God really need to create? Wasn't he fine by himself? Couldn't he have done without us? Maybe he himself feels the same way sometimes. And, uh, you know, this world of tragedy was it something that he preordained or expected. And so in the first uh, lectures we actually look at these kinds of questions and talk about the ideal which should have been established. Think of it this way. You may be familiar with the story of in the Genesis about the fall of man. And if you were to ask yourself the question, what if the fall did not take place? What if? What then would have emerged? And what kind of world would we have been born into? So that's the kind of way we look at it. In this lecture we take a look at what actually happened. And that uh, we look at the root of the problem of conflict and why there are such things as evil in the world. So this is what we talk about here. The, the fall of man, if I can get this thing to move forward. Let's see. Do you have yours there? Uh, mine seems to be somehow stuck. Maybe I'll... I'll uh, I might have to restart because it seems to have frozen, the, the system has frozen. Just give me a few minutes. This is one of the what-ifs I had put the thing in earlier or later.
So we're back in business. So we're going to talk about the human foe, and I'll be sometimes standing up, so if you don't mind. Uh, and uh, I think most of you, if not all of you, have heard of that story, that there was uh, somehow human beings fell away from the grace of God. Somehow they found themselves in a situation where they no longer lived within the realm of God's love or experiencing God as a reality of their daily life. And uh, all cultures, you know, beyond, for example, the cultures which have uh, you know, the Abrahamic faiths, have some kind of story, some kind of uh, tale or myth or whatever, which speaks about uh, some mistake or some uh, action which resulted in evil coming into this world. And uh, Of course, in Greek mythology they talked about the Pandora's box, and in other cultures, in totally different regions of the world, they have a similar type of tale where somebody committed a particular action which resulted in uh, human beings losing their way or in some way uh, going in the wrong direction and, and uh, finding evil. And so today we can say that we basically live in, you cannot read it there very well, but we live in hell on earth. Yeah? As I mentioned to you earlier that uh, if you look at the world news at any time, most of the news is bad, whether it's about the tragic earthquake in eastern Turkey or the um, collapse of the euro, which seems almost imminent this evening, I'm not sure if they'll be able to fix it, to the uh, you know, wars in many different parts of the world that are continually going on. There's been no time in human history when there hasn't been some kind of conflict somewhere in the world. And uh, we just came out of the 20th century this was probably one of the most bloody centuries in human history. Some people have uh, suggested that actually the numbers of people that died in the 20th century, when you combine the total numbers in wars in that time, or other forms of violence, that have died during the 20th century, is greater than the combined total of all people who have died violently in previous human histories. So, we think of the 20th century as a very sort of advanced century and that we saw the development of science and technology. We were able to develop nuclear power, we were able to, you know, break the barrier of space, we were able to, you know, develop systems which were unthinkable, unimaginable even, in previous centuries. But yet in the same century that humans have shown incredible ingenuity, we've also shown incredible brutality, often with the same inventions. Nuclear power was used for peaceful purposes, but also we saw destroying cities. Uh, aerodynamic principles which help us to fly around the world and, you know, feel very close to people. These machines were used then to bomb and destroy cities. And so, so many of the very good things that we've experienced in uh, the 20th century actually have been experienced not for the good things they could do, but for the very evil things they could do. So when we now moved into the 21st century, I know that a lot of people felt, well, this is going to be a different time. We'll probably enter an era of peace and prosperity and so on. I remember at that time living in Moscow when the Soviet Union collapsed. And I was thinking, well, this is it. You know, it's finally over. That's the last great struggle in human history. The Soviet Union and the West no longer in confrontation. The threat of nuclear annihilation is gone. But since that time, we've had terrible situations such as Rwanda, former Yugoslavia, 9-11, the Iraq, Afghanistan war, you know, all the tragedies that have actually continued right into the new millennium. So we have not resolved the problem of evil. And so we want to take a look here at this question, you know, what is the origin of evil? Is evil there because of a particular kind of people are there? A particular kind of ideology is there? Uh, what is the reason why we find ourselves entrapped in this problem of evil. We need to look at the human condition and uh, you know, everybody has two parts. We have what we call the conscience, which is basically that sort of trigger within us which reminds us every now and again in a very quiet voice that we should or should not be doing this. And we have an other part in ourselves which drives us or helps, you know, makes us seek after what is wrong. And uh, if I were to ask you, what for you do you think is easier to do? What is right or what is wrong, generally? What would your answer be? 
don't rush now. <laughs> is it easier to do something selfish or unselfish in this world? Depends. Speaking for myself, <laughs> it is far easier to be selfish. Far easier. Because often there's instant gratification in selfish actions. To, to actually pursue goodness often, it takes more effort and sometimes self-denial to pursue what is right. Often the way of evil is actually the way of instant gratification. And so that's why so many people, especially uh, younger generation, tend easily to be drawn in that direction, not knowing the long-term results or consequences. And so, if we follow our conscience, we will become people of character. We will be able to respect ourselves because of the goodness that results from doing that. And, uh, you know, there's a statement of Christ that he said that you should love your neighbor as you love who? Yourself. yourself, right? But what should you love about yourself? The goodness, the godliness in yourself. Huh? On the other hand, you have an evil mind which leads us to do what is wrong and ends up making us feel a lot of guilt. You know, just a few days ago we saw the tragic end, well, of course, for a lot of people it wasn't a tragedy, but of uh, Gaddafi, right? So, I'm sure in the last moments of his life, just before he was killed, he must have concluded, all my life of power and fame and riches, and I could do what I want, when I want, how I want, was worthless. Because look at now how, how it all ends. You know, so and a lot of people who have ended up in such a situation must have thought that as uh, their last living thoughts, that uh, even they had such freedom to do what they wanted. But because of the evil they did, it was not worth it. It reminds me very much of the statement of uh, Jesus where he said that, for what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, but loses his soul? And so, surely you see that uh, following our conscience is the wisest choice, but not necessarily the easiest choice. The great Saint Paul, who you know was probably the, the most active uh, Christian evangelist uh, from the earliest days of Christianity, he himself, despite his dramatic spiritual experience and his devotion to God and to Jesus, admitted his own struggle very much. I won't read the whole thing except the underlying part. It says, For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. So he's talking about really the common struggle that human beings have been through. And of course, uh, you know, following him and even preceding him, uh, religious people like monks and nuns, you know, they have tried to guide their lives in a way to overcome this sort of contradictory nature within themselves. And so they have denied themselves the experience of a love relationship with a member of the opposite sex because they felt somehow that that was something they had to overcome. They have denied themselves food or sleeping, comfortable sleeping conditions and so on. So the monastic way of life was a, a way that people lived in order to try to overcome what they felt were uh, desires leading them in a wrong direction. And so even as I see here, the great St. Paul had this issue. Now another thing is uh, that we humans, I think, have to admit that we are beings with two opposing purposes. We on the one hand desire what is right, like St. Paul, but we often are inclined to do what is wrong and live directly in contradiction, even while 